Halloween is almost upon us. For all the talk of fear and terror associated with this time of year, I've come to learn that Halloween is not at all frightening. It is amusing, if nothing else. Children dressing in costumes and wandering from door to door requesting sweets for the simple act of dressing as something they're not. I find it humorous that children find such a joy in this meaningless activity. However, as I've stated previously in another entry, meaning is found in the most trivial of things to the right people. And to children, something mundane might be the most important thing of all. I once attempted to trick-or-treat as well. I disguised myself as a child in a Grim Reaper costume. Fitting, right? I then knocked on a door and waited to see what would happen. An elderly woman answered the door, and I just stared at her for a very long time. She didn't recognize me, but I knew her, and she would come to know me in about three weeks. It was a very uncomfortable meeting. She offered candy, and I took it, but I ended up dropping it in the bag of some other child I passed by. I couldn't accept her gift, not when I knew I would be taking her away from this world in a few weeks' time. But I've had very enjoyable experiences on Halloween as well. I recall with satisfaction the night I had quite the time. It was in a small suburban area outside of Chicago. These three boys of about 15 years were riding around on bikes and what appeared to be skeleton outfits, if memory serves. They had bags of candy, but they weren't going door to door. When they weren't tossing eggs from a carton at a random house, they were jumping out of bushes or from behind trees and terrifying little children into fleeing with bags of candy left behind them. That was where they acquired their bounty, quickly scooping up and taking the bags and then fleeing before parents or the proper authorities could nab them. I'd been in the area to pick up a few souls in an unfortunate car accident, but I had some spare time and I felt I should intercede on this escapade of theirs. As I've said, I do not particularly like the skeleton frightening look that most modern art creates of me. I can look like whatever I please, and the grim reaper skeleton in a robe with a large scythe is quite macabre and not the sort of thing I want to be associated with but for these young men I made a very special exception. Needless to say, I had to stifle a laugh when they first thought I was a man in a costume until I took off the hood. Until you've stared death in the face and see the void within my eyes, you cannot know terror. <laughs> They're fine, I assure you. All three are very much alive and I'm sure thinking twice about what they do on a Halloween evening. I wasn't sure what to do with their candy after they left it behind, so I kept a few for myself, but dropped off the three bags by a hospital I was visiting. I'm sure the nurses were very surprised to find them. In fact, I found an interesting taste for Milky Way bars that night, but I digress. That's all in the past, anyway. Today I sit beside a statue in some park I've quite forgot the name of, in the form of a young woman in a coat and jeans. I blend right in, I assure you. In about an hour or so, a man is going to have a stroke here, and the paramedics won't be here in time to save him. <sighs> I do apologize for writing that. I'm sure I've shattered the jovial mood I'd just created. But at the end of it all, fun and levity are rare commodities I can partake in for this job. This talk of Halloween has brought an interesting subject to my mind, however. As I said, there are many who fear me, fear death. But am I afraid? What does death have to fear from anything? I am the end of mortal existence. I am the final punctuation mark on the book of life. Who is more frightening than I? It is not who I am frightened of, it is what. I am frightened more than anything of the responsibility I carry. The reality that at any time and in some way I will be called to perform my task in a more direct and large manner. Once there was a great flood and for forty days I was reaping the souls of those who did not know how to swim. Another day I was in Hiroshima and shortly after that Nagasaki, cleaning up the closest depiction of hell I had ever witnessed. There was a plane that crashed into a pair of towers that forced me to work quickly and carefully for hours upon hours. And to this day, I'm still cleaning up after that incident. 
All of those I'm sure I will discuss in more detail someday, but for now my mind is locked on Egypt. And the day God called me to do that once mighty and matchless kingdom, the greatest justice it had ever known. In the most twisted way, it was my first experience trick-or-treating. Though I prayed fervently that no one answered the door for me when I knocked. I remember the bitterness, the pain in his voice. I was to go in the night, seek out the firstborn of every household and claim their souls. I remember the coldness of that evening as I flew into the city. I was but a phantom, drifting from house to house, and each time looking for lamb's blood above the door. In the Hebrew districts I saw many houses with a lather of blood above, and I was pleased to see it, always letting out a sigh of relief at the sight. Faithfulness was shown, and I passed the house by, not looking back. Occasionally as I passed a house I would hear muttering, praying or weeping inside, afraid of what waited beyond the door. But it was I who was afraid, afraid that I would come to a house without the blood, because I knew what would become of that house if there wasn't. I'm ashamed to say that there were a few Hebrew houses without the markings on the door, and I had my orders. I swept in without pause and without hesitation, swiftly but carefully. I extracted the soul of the firstborn child before turning again and leaving before the child's parents even had the sense to wake up. And the further into Egypt I went, the more houses were left unmarked, and my heart broke with each house I entered. Some children were still awake when I took them. I recall one being a boy carrying a water jug into his house. (laughs) He didn't make it two steps into the doorway before I was upon him. Again, I was careful, but I was efficient, and if it's any consolation, I was weeping myself. I did not relish my work that night. I did not enjoy the task I had been given. It was one of the most painful I had ever had to commit. So many in Egypt were suffering. So many wails in the night. It was as though I were wandering through some haunted graveyard as if angry spirits were gnashing and wailing in rage and in mourning. When I finally came to the Pharaoh's palace, there were guards posted, but the sight of me sent all of them running for their lives. I did not pursue them. They were not who I was seeking. I had little interest. Although, now that I think about it, I approached the room of Pharaoh's son, and there was one god who stood in my path. With quaking knees, he raised his spear to me, a feeble attempt to stall me. I didn't even slow down as I brushed past him, his soul in my arms, before he even struck the floor. But the son of Pharaoh did not stir at any of this. Safe and asleep, ignorant to who had entered his palace and his sense of immunity. How comforting it must be to live in such bliss and freedom, to not have any fear of being touched or harmed, to believe you were unreachable. He would never know the feeling of vulnerability that so many others tonight had, and yet it made him so easier to claim. After hours of tiring work, I flew from the city with thousands of souls in my weary arms. And behind me the howls and mourns of the Egyptians and unfaithful followed me into the heavens. I did not look back down at the world as I went. I simply tried to block out the lamentation. As I delivered the souls of the children, I collapsed and wept outside of Heaven's Gate. I had felt such fear and pain that night. Fear at the knowledge of my actions. Fear at the cold efficiency with which I performed it. I had truly been the essence of my craft. I had devastated families as simply as snuffing out a candle. I knew it was for just reasons. I knew it was at the will of the Creator. I do not lament or regret the necessity of the task, but what terrifies me is the fact that I had to do it, and the fact that it was so cold. How easily I can bring pain and agony to this world. How horrifying it must feel to believe I am knocking at the door of someone's house. 
Just like that old woman who I met that night trick-or-treating, she had no idea who I was, had no inkling of the fear others have felt at my coming. What a contrast. On that night, so many thousands of years ago, I knocked on doors with lamb's blood, and no one answered. But here, a woman answered with a big smile on her face, not knowing that in only three weeks' time I would return for her. Those memories flood back. Perhaps that is why I could not accept her generosity. The boys who I terrified years earlier, the troublemakers who I sparked horror in with my simple appearance, that was familiar to me too. Halloween is the night I remind myself that I am something people fear, and the nature of my existence makes me pause. I am afraid of the necessity of my being, afraid of the inevitability and coldness of my tasks. <laughs> I fear I've gone on and on here, and I do apologize if I've made you uncomfortable. Perhaps I could get my mind off these memories by trick-or-treating again this year, though I will likely try a different look than a grim reaper appearance. Perhaps a pirate. No, no, I've had too many encounters with their lot in the past. A doctor, maybe. I'll have to think on that more. But later. For now, I hear my next appointment on its way. I'll write again when I have the time. Sincerely, Death.